And now on Radio 4, after a long absence, George Bernard Shaw returns to our airwaves in this new two-part adaptation of Major Barbara, starring Eleanor Tomlinson. It's January 1906, and Barbara's mission is to save souls in the West Ham Salvation Army shelter in London's East End. But the return of a long-lost family member could change everything. A battle of wills is about to begin. children of one father and as sinners go they are all the same and their salvation will be as such and it is waiting for them it is waiting for you it is waiting for all of us Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw. Episode 1. Mother? Mother? There you are. Morrison said you wanted to see me. What is the matter? Presently, Stephen. I have nearly finished this letter. Oh. Who left the speaker? Don't begin to read. I shall require all your attention. It was only while I was waiting. Don't make excuses. I've not kept you waiting very long, I think. Not at all. And don't fiddle with your watch chain. I beg your pardon. Now, are you attending to me? Of course. No, it's not of course. I want something much more than your everyday matter of course attention. I'm going to speak to you very seriously, Stephen. I wish you would let that chain alone. Have I done anything to annoy you, Mother? If so, it was quite unintentional. Nonsense. Oh, my poor boy, did you think I was angry with you? What is it, then? You're making me very uneasy. I really cannot bear the whole burden of our family affairs any longer. You must advise me. You must assume the responsibility. I? You know I have never interfered in the household. I should think not. I don't want you to order the dinner. I mean in our family affairs. Well, you must interfere now, for they're getting quite beyond me. I have thought sometimes that perhaps I ought, but really, Mother, I I know so little about them. And what I do know is so painful. It is so impossible to mention some things to you. I suppose you mean your father? Yes. My dear, we can't go on all our lives not mentioning him. It's cold in here. Let's go into the parlour. I've asked Morrison to light the fire. But the girls are all right. They're engaged. Yes, I've made a very good match for Sarah. Charles Lomax will be a millionaire at 35. But that is ten years ahead. And in the meantime, his trustees cannot, under the terms of his father's will, allow him more than £800 a year. So we'll have to find at least another £800 a year until that time. And even then, they will be as poor as church mice. And what about Barbara? I thought Barbara was going to make the most brilliant career of all of you. Did you, Mother? What does she do? Joins the Salvation Army, (laughs) discharges her maid, lives on a pound a week, and walks in one evening with a professor of Greek, (laughs) whom she has picked up in the street, and who pretends to be a Salvationist and actually plays the drum for her in public because he has fallen head over ears in love with her. I was rather taken aback when I heard they were engaged. Cousins is a very nice fellow, certainly. Nobody would ever guess that he was born in Australia, but... Oh, Adolphus Cousins will make a very good husband. After all, nobody can say a word against Greek. It stamps a man at once as an educated gentleman. Ah, Morrison. Ah, lady, the fire is lit in the parlour. Thank you, Morrison. Oh, yes, much warmer in here. Thank you, Morrison. And I've also put in the tea things as requested. Tea? At this time? Would you like me to pour, my lady? We will manage. Leave us now. Very good, my lady. Of course, I was thinking only of Cousin's income. However, he's not likely to be extravagant. Ah, 
Don't be too sure of that. I know you're quiet, simple, refined, poetic people like Adolphus Cousins, quite content with the best of everything. No, Barbara will need at least £2,000 a year. Besides, my dear, you must marry soon. I don't approve of the present fashion of philandering bachelors and late marriages, and I'm trying to arrange something for you. It's very good of you, but perhaps I'd better arrange that for myself. Tea? I couldn't. You don't mind if I... Of course not. Nonsense. You're much too young to begin matchmaking. You would be taken in by some pretty little nobody. Of course, I don't mean that you are not to be consulted. Oh, you know that as well as I do. Hmm. Now, don't sulk. I'm not sulking. What has all this got to do with... with my father? Oh, my dear Stephen. Where is the money to come from? It is easy enough for you and the other children to live on my income as long as we are in the same house. But I can't keep four families in four separate houses. You know how poor my father is. He has barely 7,000 a year now. And really, if he were not the Earl of Stevenage, he would have to give up society. He can do nothing for us. He says, naturally enough, that it is absurd that he should be asked to provide for the children of a man who is rolling in money. <laughs> you see, my dear, your father must be fabulously wealthy because there is always a war going on somewhere. Well, you need not remind me of that. I've hardly ever opened a newspaper in my life without seeing our name in it. The undershaft torpedo. The undershaft quick-firers, the undershaft ten-inch, the undershaft disappearing rampart gun, the undershaft submarine, and now the undershaft aerial battleship. At Harrow, they called me the Woolwich Infant. At Cambridge, it was the same. A little brute at King's spoilt my Bible, your first birthday present to me, oh. by writing under my name, Son and Heir to Undershaft and Lazarus, Death and Destruction Dealers, Address, Christendom and Judea. But that was not so bad as the way I was kowtowed to everywhere because my father was making millions by selling cannons. It's not only the cannons, but the war loans that Lazarus arranges under cover of giving credit for the cannons. Oh, you know, Stephen, it is perfectly scandalous. Those two men, Andrew Undershaft and Lazarus, positively have Europe under their thumbs. That is why your father is able to behave as he does. He is above the law. He does not actually break the law. Not break the law. He's always breaking the law. He broke the law when he was born. His parents were not married. Father, is that true? Uh, perhaps I will have some tea after all. Thank you. Of course it's true. That was why we separated. He married without letting you know this? Oh, no. To do Andrew justice, that was not the sort of thing he did. Besides, you know the undershaft motto, unashamed. Everybody knew. But you said that was why you separated. Yes, because he was not content with being a foundling himself. He wanted to disinherit you for another foundling. That was what I could not stand. But this is so frightful to me, to have to speak to you about such things. Now, listen to me, patiently. The undershafts are descended from a foundling in the parish of St Andrew Undershaft in the city. That was long ago, in the reign of James I. Well, this foundling was adopted by an armourer and gunmaker. In the course of time, the foundling succeeded to the business, and from some notion of gratitude or some vow or something, he adopted another foundling and left the business to him. And that foundling did the same. Ever since that, the cannon business has always been left to an adopted foundling named Andrew Undershaft. And my father... Your father was adopted in that way. Mm. And he pretends to consider himself bound to keep up the tradition and adopt somebody to leave the business to. Of course, I was not going to stand that. There may have been some reason for it when the Undershafts could only marry women in their own class, whose sons were not fit to govern great estates. But there could be no excuse for passing over my son. I'm afraid I should make a poor hand of managing a cannon foundry. Nonsense. You could easily get a manager and pay him a salary. My father evidently had no great opinion of my capacity. Oh, stuff, child. You were only a baby. It had nothing to do with your capacity. More tea? Yes, please. Andrew did it on principle, just as he did every perverse and wicked thing on principle. Then it was on my account that your home life was broken up, Mother. I am sorry. Well, dear, there were other differences. 
I really cannot bear an immoral man. Your father didn't exactly do wrong things. He said them and thought them. And that was what was so dreadful. He really had a sort of religion of wrongness. Just as one doesn't mind men practising immorality, so long as they own that they are in the wrong by preaching morality, so I couldn't forgive Andrew for preaching immorality while he practised morality. All this simply bewilders me. People may differ on matters of opinion or even about religion, but how can they differ about right and wrong? Right is right and wrong is wrong, and if a man cannot distinguish them properly, he is either a fool or a rascal, that's all. Oh, that's my own boy. And now that you understand the situation, what do you advise me to do? I must get the money somehow. We cannot take money from him. I'd rather go and live in some cheap place like Bedford Square or even Hampstead that take a farthing of his money. But after all, Stephen, our present income comes from Andrew. I never knew that. We are utterly dependent on him and his canons, then. Certainly not. The money is settled. But he provided it, so... You see, it is not a question of taking money from him or not. It is simply a question of how much. I would die sooner than ask him for another penny. You mean that I must ask him. I have asked your father to come this evening. This evening? Here, father. Oh, now look at what you've done. Your grandmother's Minton. Oh, nothing's broken. I said nine o'clock. I'll have to prepare the girls and have asked Charles Lomax and Adolphus to dinner on purpose that they might be here. Andrew had better see them in case he should cherish any delusions as to their being capable of supporting their wives. Stephen, I shall need all your countenance and authority. Do stop stoking that fire. I don't know how Barbara will take it. Barbara? Ever since they made her a major in the Salvation Army, she never wears anything but that uniform. She has developed a propensity to have her own way and order people about, which quite cows me sometimes. I'm sure I don't know where she picked it up. I can't think. Anyway, Barbara shan't bully me. But still, it's just as well that your father should be here before she has time to refuse to meet him or make a fuss. Oh, don't look nervous, Stephen. It will only encourage Barbara to make difficulties. I'm nervous enough, goodness knows, but I don't show it. And stop stoking that fire! Yes, Mother. in the corner and took the loaves. Oh, they smell delicious. Mmm, so they do. Uh, put them here, Jenny. I have a few outside already. Rummy Mitchin's just arrived. Oh, I haven't seen her in a while. Oh, and a man. I'll get some bread and treacle out to them. I've got the milk on the tray. Uh, let me take it. Uh, would you uh, get the door, please, Jenny? I'll see to this. Uh, yes, Major. Sorry for the delay. I expect you're famished. Oh. We're waiting on the bread. Most grateful, Major. Well, it's good enough to eat. <laughs> I hope so. Is what the Lord has provided. I'll be back soon with my notebook to take your names. Right you are. Oh, many thanks. <laughs> Call that a meal? Good enough for you, perhaps, but what is it to me, an intelligent working man? Working man? <laughs> what are you? Painter. <laughs> I dare say. You dare say. I know. <laughs> Every loafer that can't do nothing calls itself a painter. Well, mm -hmm. I'm a real painter. Grainer, finisher, 38 bob a week when I can get it. <laughs> What's your name? Price. Bronte O'Brien Price. Usually called Snobby Price for short. Snobby's a carpenter, ain't he? You said you was a painter. Not that kind of snob, but a genteel sort. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Rummy Mitchins, sir. Your health, Miss Mitchins. <coughs> Mrs. Mitchins. What? Oh, rummy. Yes. Rummy. <laughs> Respectable married woman rummy getting rescued by the Salvation <sighs> Army by pretending to be a bad one. Same old game. Well, what am I to do? I can't starve. Them Salvation lasses is dear good girls, but the better you are, the worse they like to think you were before they rescued you. Why shouldn't they have a bit of credit, poor loves? And... <sighs> 
Where would they get the money to rescue us if we was to let on we're no worse than other people? Thieving swine. <laughs> we're companions in misfortune, Rummy. <laughs> <laughs> Who saved you, Mr. Pride? Was it Major Barbara? No, I come here on my own. Oh. I'm going to be Bronte O'Brien Price, the converted painter. Mm. I know what they like. I'll tell him how I blasphemed and gambled and what my poor old mother. <gasps> You used to, to beat your mother? Not lightly, she used to beat me. <laughs> no matter, you come and listen to the converted painter and you'll hear how she was a pious mm -hmm. woman that taught me me prayers at her knee and how I used to come home drunk and drag her out of bed by <laughs> snow white hairs and lemon to her with a poker. <laughs> yes, I'll play the game as good as any of them. I'll see somebody struck by lightning and hear a voice saying, Snobby Price, where will you spend eternity? I'll have a time of it, I tell you. <laughs> Come pluck up, Mr. Shirley. I'll get you something to eat. You'll be all right then. Uh, let me help you with him, uh, Miss Hill. Uh, yeah. You're too kind. I think nothing of it, poor old man. Cheer up, brother. You'll find rest and peace and happiness here. Mm -hmm. Hurry up with the food, miss. He's fair done. Oh, will do. Uh, Mr. Shirley, I'm just going to get you something to eat. Right, yeah, miss. Thanks so much. Here, yeah, buck up, Daddy. She's <laughs> fetching you a thick slice of bread and treacle and a mug of sky blue. Sit yourself down here. Oh. Keep up your old art. Never say die. I'm not an old man. I'm only 46. Oh. The grey patch come in my hair before I was 30. All he wants is free penna for their die. Am I to be turned on the streets to starve for it? My job given to a young man that can do it no better than me because I've black hair that goes white at the first change. Here we are, Mr. Shirley. A nice thick slice of bread for you with treacle and some fresh milk. There you are, brother. Ask a blessing and tuck that into you. I never took anything before. Come, come. The Lord sends it to you. But he wasn't above taking bread from his friends, and why should you be? Besides, when we find you a job, you can pay us for it if you like. Yes, yes, uh, that's true. I can pay you back. It's only a loan. Oh, Lord. Oh, oh Lord. Oh. Oh. Well, Rummy, are you more comfortable now? Oh, God bless you, lovey. You've fed my body and saved my soul, haven't you? Dear Rummy. You, lady. Who's he, then? Oh, I ain't seen him ever. I know you. You're the one that took away my girl. Your girl? I'm sorry, but, but You're I... the one that set her against me. Well, I'm going to have her out. Not that I care a curse for her or you, see, but I'll let her know and I'll let you know. I'm going to give her a doing that'll teach her to cut away from me. That ain't nice. My arm. Now, in with you and tell her to come out before I come in and kick her out. Tell her Bill Walker wants her. Girl, you're hurting me. Please let go. Hey, leave her alone. What are you doing? You let go of Miss Hill. She'll know what that means. And if she keeps me waiting, it'll be worse. You stop and draw back to me, and I'll start on you, do you hear? There's your way. In you go. <laughs> what do you mean, pushing a woman on the ground? Oh, oh Miss Hill, take my hand. Let me help you up. Oh, oh. Thank you. There ain't no way to treat anyone. Easy there, mate. She ain't doing you no harm. What are you calling mate? You're going to stand up for her, are you? Put up your hands. Oh, you great brute, you... Oh, God forgive you. How could you strike an old woman like that? I... My hand. You, God forgive me again, and I'll God forgive you one on the jaw and stop you praying for a week. <laughs> You anything to say against it, huh? No, matey. She ain't anything to do with me. Good job for you. I put two meals into you and fight you with one finger after you, starved cur. Now, Miss Hill, you're going to fetch out Mog Habijam, or I'm going to knock your face off and fetch it myself. Oh, please, someone go in and tell Major Barbara. <laughs> Quick, run me inside, away from him. <laughs> you want to go in and tell your major of me, do you? Oh, please don't drag my hat. Let me... Oh, God, give me strength again. Now, you go and show her that. And tell her, if she wants one like it, to come and interfere with me. I... I will... Yeah. Finish your mess and get out of my way. You take a liberty with me and I'll smash you over the face with this mug and cut your eye out. Don't provoke me to lay it across yours. Cheer. You like an old man to eat, don't you? When you're finished with the women. But you hit my son-in-law's brother. Who's he? Todger Fairmile at Bull's Pond. Huh? 
Him that won 20 pounds off the Japanese wrestler at the musical by standing out 17 minutes, 4 seconds against him. I ain't no musical wrestler. Will you box Todger Fairmile if I put him on you? Say the word. I'll stand up to any man alive. If he was 10 Todger Fairmiles. <laughs> you box. Slap an old woman with the back of your hand. Hit a girl in the jaw and only make her cry. If Todger Fairmile had done it, she wouldn't have got up inside of ten minutes. No more than you would if he got on you. Yeah, I'd set a batch in myself if I had a week's feeding in me instead of two months' starvation. Oh, I'm going in there to fetch my girl. You're going to the station on a stretcher, more likely, and they'll take the gin and devil out of your hair when they get you inside. You mind what you're about. The Major here is the Earl of Stevenage's granddaughter. Go on. You'll see. Well, uh, I, I ain't done nothing to her. Suppose she said you did? Who'd believe you? God, there's no justice in this country. Tell me what them people can do. I'm as good as her. Tell her, sir. It's just what a fool like you would do. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> good morning, miss. Sit down, make yourself at home. <clears throat> now then, since you've made friends with us, we want to know all about you. So, names and addresses and traits. Peter Shirley, fitter. Chucked out two months ago because I was too old. Steady. Teetotaler. Never been out of a job before. Good worker. And sent to the knackers like an old horse. No matter. If you did your part, God will do his. My religion's not concern of anybody but myself. I know. Secularist? Did I offer to deny it? Why should you? My own father's a secularist, I think. Our father, yours and mine, fulfills himself in many ways, and I dare say he knew what he was about when he made a secularist of you. So buck up, Peter. We can always find a job for a steady man like you. Grateful, Major. And what's your name? What's that to you? Hmm. I just put, afraid to give his name. Any trade? Who's afraid to give his name? If you want to bring a charge against me, bring it. The name's Bill Walker. Bill Walker. Oh, I know. You're the man that Jenny Hill was praying for inside just now. What are you writing? And uh, what called is she to pray for me? I don't know. Perhaps it was you that cut her lip? Yeah, it was me that cut her lip. I'm not afraid of you. Now, how could you be, since you're not afraid of God? You're a brave man, Mr. Walker. It takes some pluck to do our work here, but none of us would dare lift a hand against a girl like that fear of her father in heaven. I want none of your canting, Jewel. Oh, I suppose you think I'll come in a beg from you, like this damaged lot here. Damaged, you say? Now look... Not me. I don't want your bread and scrape and cat lap. I don't believe in your God. No more than you do yourself. <laughs> I beg your pardon for putting your name down, Mr. Walker. I'll strike it out. Hey, 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 hey. Let my name alone. Ain't it good enough to be in your book? Well, you see, there's no use in putting your name down unless I can do something for you, is there? What's your trade? There's no concern of yours. Just so. <clears throat> I'll put you down as the man who struck poor little Jenny Hill in the mouth. See, I've had about enough of this. What did you come to us for? I come for my girl, see? I come to take her out of this and to break her jewels for her. Blimey. Now, you see, I was right about your trade. I... Uh... What's her name? Her name's Mog Abrajam. That's what her name is. Oh, yeah, she's gone to Canning Town to our barracks there. Are you lying to get shut of me? I don't want to get shut of you. I want to keep you here and save your soul. Oh, you'd better stay. You're going to have a bad time today, Bill. Who's going to give it to me? You, perhaps? Someone you don't believe in. But you'll be glad afterwards. I'll go to Canny Town to be out of the reach of your tongue. And if I don't find Mog there, I'll come back and do two years for you. So help me God if I don't. It's no use, Bill. She's got another bloke. What? <laughs> That's torn it. One of her own converts. He fell in love with her when he saw her with her soul saved and her face clean and her hair washed. What's she wash it for? The carroty slut. It's red. Well, it's quite lovely now because she wears a new look in her eyes with it. Oh, I'll teach her to drop me as if I was dirt and I'll teach him to meddle with my Judy. What's his bleeding name? Sergeant Todger Fairmile. <laughs> I say, um, Sarah, are you going to finish your milk pudding? I am. Oh, rotter! 
It was delicious. I suppose we'd better go through. Whatever can it be? Stephen was awfully quiet earlier. Was he? I didn't notice. You never notice anything, Trolley. <laughs> his mother had something on her mind. I can always tell. Mother? <laughs> Charlie and Dolly to come in. Barbara, I will not have Charles called Cholly. The vulgarity of it positively makes me ill. It's all right, Mother. Cholly's quite correct nowadays. And I call Adolphus Dolly because... because I do. Are they to come in? If they will behave themselves. Uh, come in, Dolly, and behave yourself. Come in, Cholly. <laughs> Sit down, all of you. Stephen, move along on the settee. Yes, Mother. <laughs> I don't in the least know what you're laughing at, Adolphus. I'm surprised at you, though I expected nothing better from Charles Lomax. Uh, Barbara has been trying to teach me the West Ham Salvation March. I see nothing to laugh at in that, nor should you, if you are really converted. Um, you, you were not present. It was really funny, I believe. <laughs> Ripping. <laughs> oh, be quiet, Charles. Now, listen to me, children. Your father is coming here this evening. <laughs> oh, I say... You're not called on to say anything, Charles. Are you serious, Mother? Of course I'm serious. It is on your account, Sarah, and also on Charles's. I hope you're not going to object, Barbara. I? Why should I? But, Barbara, aren't you shocked? I was. My father has a soul to be saved like anybody else. He's quite welcome as far as I'm concerned. Oh. But, really, don't you know? What do you wish to convey, Charles? Well, you must admit this is a bit thick. Adolphus, you're a professor of Greek. Can you translate Charles Lomax's remarks into reputable English for us? If I may say so, Lady Britt, I think Charles has rather happily expressed what we all feel. Mm. Uh, Homer, speaking of autologous, uses the same phrase. Uh, not that I mind, you know, if, if Sarah don't. Thank you. Have I your permission, Adolphus, to invite my own husband to my own house? You have my unhesitating support in everything you do. Sarah, have you nothing to say? Do you mean that he is coming regularly to live here? Certainly not. The spare room is ready for him if he likes to stay for a day or two and see a little more of you, but there are limits. <laughs> I wonder how the old man will take it. Much as the old woman will, no doubt, Charles. Oh, I, I didn't mean... Um, you I, didn't least, uh... think, Charles. You never do, and the result is you never mean anything. Mm. And now, please attend to me, children. Your father will be quite a stranger to us. I don't suppose he's seen Sarah since she was a little kid. Not since she was a little kid, Charles, as you express it, with that elegance of diction and refinement of thought that seem never to desert you. <laughs> Accordingly... Uh, oh, now I've forgotten what I was going to say. That comes of your provoking me to be sarcastic, Charles. Adolphus, will you kindly tell me where I was? You, you were saying that as Mr Undershaft has not seen his children since they were babies, he will form his opinion of the way you've brought them up from their behaviour tonight, and that, therefore, you wish us all to be particularly careful to conduct ourselves well, especially Charles. Look here, Lady Britt didn't say that. I did, Charles. Adolphus's recollection is perfectly correct. <laughs> all right, Mother. We'll do you credit. We'll, we'll behave. Our best. Uh... Might I speak a word to you, my lady? Nonsense, Morrison. Show him in. Uh, yes, my lady. Does Morrison know who he is? Of course. He has always been with us. I remember when I was a child. Morrison used to... Enough, Stephen. Yes, Mother. Must be a regular corker for him, don't you know? Is this a moment to get on my nerves, Charles, with your outrageous expressions? But, but this is something out of the ordinary, really. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Mr. Undershaft... Good evening, Andrew. How do you do, my dear? You look a good deal older. Well, I am somewhat older. Time has stood still with you. Rubbish. This is your family. Is it so large? I'm sorry to say my memory is failing very badly in some things. Uh, I can see you are my eldest. Uh, I'm very glad to meet you again, my uh, boy. No, but uh, look here, don't you know what? Oh, I say, Andrew, do you mean to say that you don't remember how many children you have? Well, I'm afraid I am. Uh, well, they, they've grown so much. Uh, am I making any ridiculous mistake? I may as well confess I recollect only one son. 
But so many things have happened since, of course. Uh, um... Andrew, you are talking nonsense. Of course you have only one son. Perhaps you will be good enough to introduce me, my dear. That is Charles Lomax, who is engaged to Sarah. My dear sir, I beg your pardon. Not at all. Delighted, I assure you. Then you must be my son. How are you, my young friend? Uh, He's very like you, my love. You flatter me, Mr. Undershaft. My name is Adolphus Cousins, engaged to Barbara. That is Major Barbara Undershaft of the Salvation Army. I see by the uniform. Barbara, my dear. Father. That is Sarah, your second daughter. Hello, Papa. Sarah, of course. And this is Stephen Undershaft, your son. My dear Stephen, I beg your pardon. Not at all. Mr. Cousins, I am much indebted to you for explaining so precisely. Sit down, all of you. Sit down, Andrew. Thank you, my love. Uh, do have my chair. Most kind. Takes you some time to find out exactly where you are, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> my difficulty is that if I play the part of a father, I shall produce the effect of an intrusive stranger. Mm -hmm. And if I play the part of a discreet stranger, I may appear a callous father. <laughs> now, what can I do for you all? You need not do anything, Andrew. You are one of the family. You can sit with us and enjoy yourself. <laughs> Charles Lomax, if you can behave yourself, behave yourself. If not, leave the room. I, I'm awfully sorry, Lady Britt, but I'm really, you know, upon my soul. Charlie, <laughs> fetch your concertina and play something for us. Oh, well, perhaps that sort of thing isn't in your line, Mr Undershaft. I'm particularly fond of music. Are you? Yeah, then I'll get it. Do you play, Barbara? Only the tambourine. But Charlie, Charles is teaching me the concertina. Is Cholly also a member of the Salvation Army? He is not. He says it's bad form to be a dissenter, but I don't despair of Cholly. I made him come yesterday to a meeting at the dock gates and take collection in his hat. Hmm. It is not my doing, Andrew. Barbara is old enough to take her own way. She has no father to advise her. Oh, yes, she has. There are no orphans in the Salvation Army. Your father there has a great many children and plenty of experience, eh? Just so. How did you come to understand that? Come in, Charles. Play us something at once. Right, eh? Uh, one uh, moment, Mr Lomax. I'm rather interested in the Salvation Army. Its motto might be my own. Blood and fire. <laughs> but not your sort of blood and fire, you know. My sort of blood cleanses. My sort of fire purifies. So do ours. Come down tomorrow to my shelter, the West Ham Shelter, and see what we're doing. We're going to march to a great meeting in the Assembly Hall at Mile End. Come and see the shelter and then march with us. It'll do you a lot of good. Can you play anything? In my youth, I earned pennies and even shillings occasionally in the streets and in public house parlours by my natural talent for step dancing. Later on, I became a member of the Undershaft Orchestral Society and performed passably on the tenor trombone. <laughs> Many a sinner has played himself into heaven on the trombone, thanks to the army. Yes, but um, what about the cannon business, don't you know? Getting into heaven is not exactly in your line, is it? <laughs> Charles, well, it stands to reason, don't it? I mean, the cannon business may be necessary and all that. I mean, we can't get on without cannons, but it isn't right, you know. On the other hand, there may be a certain amount of tosh about the Salvation Army. I belong to the established church myself, but still, you can't deny its religion. And you can't go against religion, can you? Uh, at least, unless you're downright immoral, don't you know? You hardly appreciate my position, Mr Lomax. I'm not saying anything against you personally, you know. Quite so, quite so. But consider for a moment. Here I am, a manufacturer of mutilation and murder. I find myself in a specially amiable humour just now because this morning, down at the foundry, we blew 27 dummy soldiers into fragments with a gun which formerly destroyed only 13. Uh, well, the more destructive war becomes, the sooner it will be abolished, eh? Not at all. The more destructive war becomes, the more fascinating we find it. No, Mr Lomax, I am obliged to you for making the usual excuse for my trade, but I am not ashamed of it. I'm not one of those men who keep their morals and their business in watertight compartments. All the spare money my trade rivals spend on hospitals, cathedrals, and other receptacles for conscience money, I devote to experiments and researches in improved methods of destroying life and property. I've always done so, and I always shall. 
Therefore, your Christmas card moralities of peace on earth and goodwill among men are of no use to me. Your Christianity, which enjoins you to resist not evil and turn the other cheek, would make me a bankrupt. My morality, my religion, must have a place for cannons and torpedoes in it. You speak as if there were half a dozen moralities and religions to choose from, instead of one true morality and one true religion. For me, Stephen, there is only one true morality, but it might not fit you, as you do not manufacture aerial battleships. There is only one true morality for every man, but every man has not the same true morality. Uh, would you mind saying that again? It's quite simple. As Euripides says, one man's meat is another man's poison, morally as well as physically. In other words, some men are honest and some men are scoundrels. Oh, bosh, there are no scoundrels. Indeed. Are there any good men? Not one. There are neither good men nor scoundrels. There are just children of one father, and the sooner they stop calling one another names, the better. You needn't talk to me. I know them. I've had scores of them through my hounds. Scoundrels, criminals, infidels, philanthropists, missionaries, county councillors, all sorts. They are all just the same sort of sinner, and there is the same salvation ready for them all. May I ask, have you ever saved a maker of cannons? I haven't. Will you let me try? Well, I will make a bargain with you. If I go to see you tomorrow in your salvation shelter, Will you come the day after to see me in my cannon works? Oh, and take care. It may end in your giving up the cannons for the sake of the Salvation Army. Are you sure it will not end in your giving up the Salvation Army for the sake of the cannons? I will take my chance of that. And I will take my chance of the other. Hmm? <laughs> hmm. Where is your shelter? In West Ham at the sign of the cross. Ask anybody in Canning Town. Where are your works? In Perivale St Andrews, at the sign of the sword. Ask anybody in Europe. Uh, hadn't I better play something? <laughs> yes. Give us onward, Christian soldiers. Uh, well, if you are determined to have it, I insist on having it in a proper and respectable way. Charles, ring for Morrison to bring the family prayer book. <sighs> really, Mother? Oh, I say. I'm afraid I must be going. <clears throat> you cannot go now, Andrew. It would be most improper. Sit down. What will the servants think? My dear, I have conscientious scruples. Uh, may I suggest a compromise? If Barbara will conduct a little service in the drawing room with Mr Lomax as pianist, I will attend it willingly. I will even take part if a trombone can be procured. Don't mock, Andrew. Barbara, you don't think I'm mocking, my love, I hope? No, of course not, and it wouldn't matter if you were. Half the army came to their first meeting for a lark. Come along. Come, Dolly. Come, Charlie. Sarah, Mother, Stephen. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. Will you take my arm, my love? I will, Father. Jesus, oh, 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 wait for me. Adolphus, Lady Britomar, I have a very strong suspicion that you went to the Salvation Army to worship Barbara and nothing else. Don't tell on me. Mother, where are you going? To the drawing room, of course. Are you coming, Stephen? Certainly not. Never. Welcome to the Salvation Army, West Ham. Don't look like you need shelter. Still, never can tell these days. Good morning, my dear fellow. I'm Father, uh, you came. As agreed. Good morning, my dear. Mr. Shirley, Peter, this is my father. I told you he was a secularist, didn't I? <laughs> Perhaps you'll be able to comfort one another. A secularist? Not the least in the world. My religion, I am a millionaire. Hmm. Then I'm afraid you and Mr. Shirley won't be able to comfort one another after all. Come on through, Father. You're not a millionaire, are you, Peter? No, I'm proud of it. Poverty, my friend, is not a thing to be proud of. Who made your millions for you? Me and my like. 
What's keeping us poor? Keeping you rich. I wouldn't have your conscience, not for all your income. I wouldn't have your income, not for all your conscience, Mr Shirley. No, no, I... You wouldn't think he was my father, would you, Peter? <laughs> Will you go into the kitchen and lend a hand for a while? We are worked off our feet. Yeah, I'm in their debt for a meal, ain't I? Oh, not because you're in their debt, but for love of them, Peter. For love of them. Love? There, don't stare at me. In with you and give that conscience of yours a holiday. Mrs Baines, uh, Peter has volunteered to help you and Snobby in the kitchen. Ah, oh, volunteered? This is my father, Mrs Baines. Oh. How do you do, Mr Undershaft? How do you do? And washing up over there is Mr Price. People call me Snobby. Uh, uh, father, Mrs Baines is a Salvation Army General and is here for the march today. Ah. Oh. Have you been shown over the shelter, Mr Undershaft? You know the work we're doing, of course. The whole nation knows it, Mrs Baines. No, sir. The whole nation does not know it, or we should not be crippled as we are for want of money to carry our work through the length and breadth of the land. Let me tell you that there would have been rioting this winter in London, but for us... You really think so? I know it. I remember 1886, when you rich gentlemen hardened your hearts against the cry of the poor. They broke the windows of your clubs in Pall Mall. And the Mansion House Fund went up next day from £30,000 to 79000 I remember quite well. Well, won't you help me to get at the people? Hmm? They won't break windows then. <laughs> Come here, Snobby. Let me show you to this gentleman. Do you remember the window breaking? My old father thought it was a revolution, Mum. And would you break windows now? Oh, no, Mum. The windows of heaven have been opened to me. I know that the rich man is a sinner like myself. <coughs> Father, I'll take you out into the yard. You'll be able to see some more of the work that we do. I am sure you will find it illuminating, Mr Undershaft. No doubt, Mrs Baines. Ain't it? The lovely sunshine, Rummy. Oh. oh, Major, is this your father? It is. Father, this is Jenny I told you about. Poor Miss Hill. Barbara told me you were most unfortunate. And there's the cur what done the mean deeds to me, Hannah. Uh, that outpatient over here. Oh, we shall cure him in no time. Just watch. I shall be fascinated, my dear. Been here all night, Bill. What if I have? It would be nice to just stamp on Mark Habijam's face, wouldn't it? It's a lie. I've never said so. Who told you what was in my mind? Only your new friend. What new friend? The devil, Bill. When he gets round people, they get miserable, just like you. I am miserable. Well, if you're happy, then why don't you look happy, as we do? I'm happy enough, I tell you. Why don't you leave me alone? What have I done to you? I ain't smashed your face, have I? It's not me that's getting at you, Bill. Who else is it? Somebody that doesn't intend you to smash women's faces, I suppose. Some body or something that wants to make a man of you. Who says I'm not a man? There's a man in you somewhere, I suppose. But why did he let you hit poor little Jenny Hill? That wasn't very manly of him, was it? I've done with it, I tell you. Chuck it. I'm sick of your Jenny Hill and her silly little face. Then why do you keep thinking about it? Why does it keep coming up against you in your mind? You're not getting converted, are you? Not me. Not likely, not off. That's right, Bill. Hold out against it. Put out your strength. Don't let's get you cheap. Todger Fairmile said he wrestled for three nights against his salvation, harder than he ever wrestled with the Jap at the music hall. He gave in to the Jap when his arm was going to break, but he didn't give in to his salvation until his heart was going to break. Perhaps you'll escape that. You haven't any heart, have you? I've got a heart the same as anybody else. A man with a heart wouldn't have bashed poor little Jenny's face, would he? Oh. <laughs> Will you leave me alone? It's your soul that's hurting you, Bill, and not me. We've been through it all ourselves. Come with us, Bill, to a brave manhood on Earth and eternal glory in Heaven. Come! Oh, there you are, Dolly. Oh, Mr. Undershaft, you came. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Cousins. Let me introduce you to a new friend of mine, Mr. Bill Walker. This is my bloke, Bill, Mr. Cousins. Mr. Bill Walker gonna marry him. I am. Do you hear that, Papa? Loud and clear, my dear. God help him. God help him. Why? Do you think he won't be happy with me? I've only had to stand it for a morning. He'll have to stand it for a lifetime. Well, that is a, a frightful reflection, Mr Walker. 
but I can't tear myself away from Major Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. Yeah. Do you know where I'm going to and what I'm going to do? Yes. You're going to heaven and you're coming back before the week's out to tell me so. You lie. I'm going to Canning Town to spit in Todger Fairmar's eye. I bashed Jenny Hill's face and now I'll get my own face bashed and come back and show it to her. He lit me harder than I hit her. I'll make her square. Uh, you, sir, is that fair or is it not? You're a gentleman. You ought to know. Two black eyes won't make one white one, Bill. I didn't ask you. Can you never keep your mouth shut? I asked a gentleman. I think you're right, Mr. Walker. Yes, I should do it. It's curious. It's exactly what an ancient Greek would have done. But what good will it do? Well, it'll give Mr. Fairmile some exercise, and it will satisfy Mr. Walker's soul. Rot. There ain't no such a thing as a soul. Uh, how can you tell whether I have a soul or not? You've never seen it. I've seen it hurting you when you went against it. If you was my girl and took the word out of my mouth like that, I'll give you something you'd feel hurting so I would. Take my tip, mate. Stop her jaw or you'll die afore your time. War out. That's what you'll be. War out. I wonder. Dolly! Yes, my dear, it's very wearing to be in love with you. If it lasts, I quite think I shall die young. Should you mind? Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Papa. We've not forgotten you. I wonder. Uh, Dolly, explain the place to Papa. I haven't time. I'm taking Snobby Price out into the streets to give his confession to the masses. Mr. Price, are you ready? Coming, Major Barbara. Might as well make myself at home. Well, don't get too comfortable. I won't. I fancy you guess something of what is in my mind, Mr. Cousins. Exactly so. But suppose Barbara finds you out. And Lady Britomart already has. Mm. You know, I do not admit that I'm imposing on Barbara. I am quite genuinely interested in the views of the Salvation Army. The fact is, I'm a sort of collector of religions. And the curious thing is that I find I can believe them all. By the way, have you any religion? Yes. Anything out of the common? Only that there are two things necessary to salvation. Ah, the church catechism. Yeah, Charles Lomax also belongs to the established church. The two things are... Baptism and... Money and gunpowder. That is the general opinion of our governing classes. The novelty is in hearing any man confess it. Just so. Excuse me, is there any place in your religion for honour, justice, truth, love, mercy and so forth? Yes, they are the graces and luxuries of a rich, strong and safe life. Suppose one is forced to choose between them and money or gunpowder. Choose money and gunpowder. For without enough of both, you cannot afford the others. That, that's your religion? It is. <laughs> Barbara won't stand that. You'll have to choose between your religion and Barbara. So will you, my friend. She will find out that that drum of yours is hollow. Now, Father Undershaft, you are mistaken. I am a sincere Salvationist. Mm. You do not understand the Salvation Army. It is uh, the army of joy, of love, of courage. It has banished the fear and remorse and despair of the old hell-ridden evangelical sects. It marches to fight the devil with trumpet and drum with music and dancing, with banner and palm, as becomes a sally from heaven by its happy garrison. It, it, it picks the waster out of the public house and makes a man of him. It finds a worm wriggling in the back kitchen, and lo, a woman. <laughs> and men and women of rank, too, sons and daughters of the highest. It takes the poor professor of Greek, the most artificial and self-suppressed of human creatures, from his meal of roots and lets loose the rhapsodist in him reveals the true worship of Dionysus to him, sends him down the public street drumming dithyrams. Uh, uh, you, you will alarm the shelter. Oh, they are accustomed to these sudden ecstasies of piety. You, you remember what Euripides says about your money and gunpowder? I do not. Uh, One and another, in money and guns, may outpass his brother, and men in their millions float and flow and seethe with a million hopes as leaven, and they win their will or they miss their will, and their hopes are dead or are pined for still, but whoe'er can know, as the long days go, that to live is happy, has found his heaven. My own translation, what do you think of it? I think, my friend, that if you wish to know, as the long days go, that to live is happy, 
you must first acquire money enough for a decent life and power enough to be your own master. Now, you're damnably discouraging. Is, is it so hard a thing to see that the spirit of God, whate'er it be, the law that abides and changes not, ages long, the eternal and nature born, these things be strong. What else is wisdom? What of man's endeavor? Or God's high grace, so lovely and so great? To stand from fear set free, to breathe and wait, to hold a hand uplifted over fate. And shall not Barbara be loved forever? Euripides mentions Barbara, does he? Well, it's a fair translation. The word means loveliness. May I ask, as Barbara's father, how much a year she is to be loved forever on? As Barbara's father, that is more your affair than mine. I can feed her by teaching Greek, that's about all. Do you consider it a good match for her? But Mr. Undershaft, I am in many ways a weak, timid, ineffectual person, and my health is far from satisfactory. But whenever I feel that I must have anything, I get it, sooner or later. I feel that way about Barbara. I don't like marriage, I feel intensely afraid of it. And I don't know what I shall do with Barbara or what she will do with me, but I feel that I and nobody else must marry her. Please regard that as settled. Not that I wish to be arbitrary, but why should I waste your time in discussing what is inevitable? You mean that you will stick at nothing, not even the conversion of the Salvation Army to the worship of Dionysus? The business of the Salvation Army is to save, not to wrangle about the name of the Pathfinder, Dionysus or another. What does it matter? Professor Cousins, you are a young man after my own heart. Mr. Undershaft, you are, as far as I'm able to gather, a most infernal old rascal. <laughs> but you appeal very strongly to my sense of ironic humor. <laughs> <laughs> and now to business. Oh, pardon me, we were discussing religion. Why go back to such an uninteresting and unimportant subject as business? Religion is our business at present, because it is through religion alone that we can win Barbara. Have you, too, fallen in love with Barbara? Yes, with a father's love. Oh, a father's love for a grown-up daughter is the most dangerous of all infatuations. I apologize for mentioning my own pale, coy, mistrustful fancy in the same breath with it. Keep to the point. We have to win her, and we are neither of us Methodists. No, that doesn't matter. The power Barbara wields here, the power that wields Barbara herself, is not Calvinism, mm. not Presbyterianism, mm. not Methodism. Not Greek paganism either, eh? Well, I admit that. Barbara is quite original in her religion. <laughs> Aha! Barbara Undershaft would be. Her inspiration comes from within herself. And how do you suppose it got there? It is the Undershaft inheritance. I shall hand on my torch to my daughter. She shall make my converts and preach my gospel. What? Uh, money and gunpowder? Yes, money and gunpowder, freedom and power, command of life and command of death. This is extremely interesting, Mr. Undershaft. Mm. Of course, you know that you are mad. Mm. And you? Oh, uh, mad as a hatter. Mm -hmm. You are welcome to my secret since I've discovered yours. Uh, but I'm astonished. Can a madman make cannons? Would anyone else than a madman make them? And now, question for question, can a sane man translate Euripides? Absolutely not. Can a sane woman make a man of a waster or a woman of a worm? Mm -hmm. Are there two mad people or three in this salvation shelter today? Uh, you mean Barbara is as mad as we are? Pooh, Professor, let us call things by their proper names. I am a millionaire, you are a poet. Barbara is a saviour of souls. What have we three to do with the common mob of slaves and idolaters? Well, take care. Barbara is in love with the common people. So am I. Have you never felt the romance of that love? Have you ever been in love with poverty, like St. Francis? Have you ever been in love with dirt, like St. Simeon? Have you ever been in love with disease and suffering, like our nurses and philanthropists? Such passions are not virtues, but the most unnatural of all the vices. This love of the common people may please an earl's granddaughter and a university professor, but I have been a common man and a poor man, and it has no romance for me. Leave it to the poor to pretend that poverty is a blessing. Leave it to the coward to make a religion of his cowardice by preaching humility. We know better than that. 
We three must stand together above the common people. How else can we help their children to climb up beside us? Barbara must belong to us, not to the Salvation Army. Uh, well, I can only say that if you think you'll get her away from the Salvation Army by talking to her as you've been talking to me, uh, you don't know Barbara. My friend, I never ask for what I can buy. Do I understand you to imply that you can buy Barbara? No, but I can buy the Salvation Army. Quite impossible. You shall see. All religious organizations exist by selling themselves to the rich. You really are an infernal old rascal. Once I've got the army, I'll have Barbara. In episode one of Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw, Barbara was played by Eleanor Tomlinson and Adolphus Cousins by Jack Farvey. Under Shaft was played by Matthew Marsh, Lady Britomart by Rebecca Front, and Stephen by Joel McCormack. Charles Lomax was played by Kieran Hodgson, Sarah by Scarlett Brooks, and Morrison by Brian Prothero. Jenny Hill was played by Nicola Ferguson, Mrs. Baines by Susan Jameson, and Bill Walker by Ewan Bailey. Snobby Price was played by Sargon Yelda, Rami Mitchins by A.B. Allen, and Peter Shirley by Sean Baker. The concertina was played by Colin Guthrie, and the cornet by Peter Ringrose. The director was Tracy Neal. Now on Radio 4, the second part of Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw. While Barbara tries to save souls in the East End of London and raise money for the Salvation Army, her father, Andrew Undershaft, is telling Dolly the two things necessary for salvation are money and gunpowder. And once he's got the army, he'll have Barbara too. Is he, as Dolly suspects, an infernal old rascal? <laughs> children of one father and as sinners go, they are all the same and their salvation will be as such. And it is waiting for them. It is waiting for you. It is waiting for all of us. Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw. Episode 2. And here is the question I want you to ask yourself, my good people. Where do I want to spend eternity? Mr. Bronte O'Brien Price here has asked himself that very question. That I have, Major Barbara and Miss Jenny. And is here today to confess. Hooray! Hooray! Let's hear your story, brother. Oh, Mr. Price. I, Bronte O'Brien Price, some of you will know me by the name of Snobby, am ashamed to confess I used to blaspheme and gamble. Oh, Money for the shelter! And what my poor old mother something terrible. Oh, no. Yes, I did! Even though she was a good and pious woman, what taught me my prayers at her knee? I used to come home drunk and haul her out of bed by her snow-white hairs and lamb into her with the iron poker from the fireplace. But you've repented now, haven't you, Snobby? Glory be hallelujah, I have! And your path to heaven is assured. Oh, please, please give generously to keep our shelter open and to save sinners like Mr Price. God bless you, Major Barbara! Bless you, Snobby! Goodbye, and God bless you all! Oh, come on, everyone, let's get back to the shelter. Oh, you did so terribly well, Mr Price. It was having the weight of my sins lifted off me that made me fearless in my confession. Oh, Mr Price, that's thrilling! Kind words, Miss Hill. I could almost be glad of my past wickedness if I could believe that it would help to keep others straight. So it will, Snobby. Thank 
Thank you, everyone. Your playing was inspiring. Thank you, Major. Dad, Dolly, we've just had a splendid experience meeting at the other gate in Cripps Lane. I wish you'd have been there. Well, good for you, Barbara. It would have been something to see, I have no doubt. Oh, what a crowd. My tambourine is almost filled with money. I'll count how much. Glad I could help, Miss Jenny. I'll give you a hand. One shilling, two... What have you got there, Mr. Price? Haypence. Uh, well, uh, I thought it was going to roll off the table. Here. Three, four and tenpence, Major Barbara. Oh, Snobby, if you'd have given your poor mother just one more kick, we should have got the whole five shillings. <laughs> if she heard you say that, miss, she'd be sorry I didn't. <sighs> what a joy it will be to her when she hears I'm saved. Shall I contribute the odd tuppence, Barbara? The, the millionaire's might, eh? I can afford a little more if you press me. Two million millions would not be enough. There is bad blood on your hands and nothing but good blood can cleanse them. Dolly, you must write another letter for me to the papers. Oh, again. Now, I know that you don't like it, but it must be done. The starvation this winter is beating us. Everybody is unemployed. And the general says that we must close this shelter if we can't get more money. And I force the collections at the meetings until I'm ashamed, don't I, Snobby? It's a fair treat to see you work it, miss. Not a cheap jack on mile and waist could touch you at it. But I wish we could do without it. And getting at last, I think more of the collection than of the people's souls. I want to convert people, not to always be begging for the army. In a way, I'd die sooner than beg for myself. Genuine unselfishness is capable of anything, my dear. Yes, isn't it? Here, give me the money, Jenny. I'll put it away. Here, Major. Mephistopheles Machiavelli. Somewhat harsh, Mr. Cousins. How are we to feed them? I can't talk religion to a man with bodily hunger in his eyes. Major, dear. And, uh, don't comfort me, Jenny. It will be all right. We shall get the money. How? By praying for it, of course. Mrs. Baines says she prayed for it last night, and she has never prayed for it in vain. Never once. We shall see. We shall. Major, Major Barbara, here's that man back again. What man? The man that hit me. Oh, I hope he's come back to join us. Hello, Bill. Back, are you? Well, has Todger paid you out for poor Jenny's jaw? No, he ain't. I thought your jacket looked a bit torn. I would agree. It's torn. So? It's torn. Come off from being on the ground in Parkridge's Corner in Canning Town. Not on your knees, Bill. Well, that would have done you a lot of good. I was saving another man's knees at the time. He was kneeling on me head, so he was. Who was kneeling on your head? Todger Fairmiles was. He was praying for me. Praying comfortable with me as a carpet. So was my old girl, Mog. So was the old blooming meeting. And her bloke, big, big bloke, Kneeling with all his weight on me. Well, you must have done something to him first. I did what I said I'd do. I spat in his eye. Oh. He looks up at the sky and says, Oh, no, I should be found worthy to be spat upon for the gospel's sake, he says. And Mog says, Glory, hallelujah. And then he called me brother and damn me. <laughs> there, Major Barbara. You're satisfied now? Wish I'd been there, Bill. <laughs> me and all. I'm so sorry, Mr. Walker. Don't you go being sorry oh. for me. You're no call. Cool. Listen here. I broke your jaw. No, no, it didn't hurt me. Indeed, it didn't. Except for a moment. It was only that I was frightened. I don't want to be forgiven by you or by anybody. What I did, I'll pay for. I'll try to get my own jaw broke to satisfy you. Oh, no. I had two quid saved against the frost and I've a pound of it left. A mate of mine last week had words with a Judy he's going to marry. He gave a what for and he's been fined 15 bob. He had a right to hit her, because they're going to be married. But I had no right to hit you. So, put another five bob on and call it a pound's worth. Take it. Let's have no more of your forgiving and praying and your, your major jewelling me. Let what I've done be done and paid for, and let there be an end of it. Major, may I take a little of it for the army? The army is not to be bought. Are you <laughs> sure, Barbara? Of course, Dolly. Oh, we want your soul, Bill, and we'll take nothing less. Me and me few shillings ain't good enough for you. You're an earl's granddaughter, you are. Nothing less than a hundred pound for you. Come, Barbara, you could do a great deal of good with a hundred pounds. If you will set this gentleman's mind at ease by taking his pound, I will give the other ninety-nine. Blimey, ninety-nine pounds? You're too extravagant, Papa. Bill offers twenty pieces of silver. All you need offer is the other ten. That will make the standard price to buy anybody who is for sale. But I am not, and the army is not. 
You'll never have another quiet moment, Bill, till you come round to us. You can't stand out against your salvation. I can't stand out against musical wrestlers and artful-tongued women. I've offered to pay. Take it or leave it. There it is. Snobby. Snobby Price. What is it, General Baines? Your mother's at the front door asking for you. She's heard about your confession. Oh. Go, Mr. Price, and pray with her. I couldn't face her now, Major Barbara. With all the weight of my sins fresh on me, I'll, um, I'll slip out the back gate and make my way home so she can find her son waiting for her in prayer. Goodbye, Snobby, and thank you. You see? Can we take the anger and bitterness out of their hearts, Papa? Clearly, my dear. Everyone. Barbara, I have good news. Most wonderful news. My prayers have been answered. I told you they would, Jenny, didn't I? <laughs> you did, General Baines. Have we got enough money to keep the shelter open? I hope we shall have enough to keep all the shelters open. Lord Saxmundham has promised us five thousand pounds. Oh, hooray! <laughs> Glory! If... If, if what? If five other gentlemen will give a thousand each to make it up to ten thousand. Who is Lord Saxmundham? I've never heard of him. A new creation, my dear. You have heard of Sir Horace Bodger. Bodger? Do you mean the distiller? Bodger's whiskey? That is the man. He is one of the greatest of our public benefactors. He restored the cathedral at Hackington. They made him a baronet for that. He gave half a million to the funds of his party, and they made him a baron for that. What will they give him for the 5,000? There is nothing left to give him, cousins. So the 5,000, I should think, is to save his soul. Heaven grant that it may. Oh, um, <clears throat> Mr. Undershaft, you have some very rich friends. Can't you help us towards the other 5,000? We're going to hold a great meeting this afternoon at the Assembly Hall in the Mile End Road. If I could only announce that one gentleman had come forward to support Lord Saxmundham, others would follow. Mrs Baines, I can't disappoint you and I can't deny myself the satisfaction of making Bodger pay up. You shall have your £5,000. Father! Thank God! You don't thank me. Oh, sir, don't try to be cynical. Don't be ashamed of being a good man. The Lord will bless you abundantly and our prayers will be like a strong fortification round you all the days of your life. Mm. You will let me have the cheque to show at the meeting, won't you? Jenny, go in and fetch a pen and ink. Right away, General. Uh, do not disturb, Miss Hill. I have a fountain pen. I'll clear a space on the table. I should make the check out to the West Ham branch of the Salvation Army. If you will kindly do so, Mr. Undershaft. What price Salvation now, Major Barbara? Stop! Mrs. Baines, are you really going to take this money? Oh, why not, dear? Why not? Do you know what my father is? Have you forgotten that Lord Saxmundham is Bodger the Whiskey Man? Do you know that the worst thing I have had to fight here is not the devil, but Bodger? Bodger, Bodger, with his whiskey, his distilleries, and his tied houses. Are you going to make our shelter another tied house for him and ask me to keep it? Rotten drunken whiskey it is too. My dear Barbara, alcohol is a very necessary article. It heals the sick. It does nothing of the sort. Well, it assists the doctor. It makes life bearable to millions of people who could not endure their existence if they were quite sober. It enables Parliament to do things at 11 at night that no sane person would do at 11 in the morning. Is it Bodger's fault that this inestimable gift is deplorably abused by less than 1% of the poor? Salvation Army, West Ham. Barbara, will there be less drinking or more if all those poor souls we are saving come tomorrow and find the doors of our shelters shut in their faces? Lord Saxmundon gives us the money to stop drinking, to take his own business from him. Oh, There's pure self-sacrifice on Bodger's part, clearly. Bless dear Bodger. Oh, Dolly, you too. I also, Mrs. Baines, may claim a little disinterestedness. Think of my business. Think of the widows and orphans 
the men and lads torn to pieces with shrapnel and poisoned with lyddite, oh, the oceans of blood, oh. not one drop of which is shed in a really just cause, all this makes money for me. It is your work to preach peace on earth and goodwill to men. It is. Every convert you make is a vote against war. Yet I give you this money to help you hasten my own commercial ruin. Your check, madam. Oh, oh Mr. Undershaft. The, the millennium will be inaugurated by the unselfishness of Undershaft and Bodger. Oh, be joyful. Who would have thought that any good could have come out of war and drink? <laughs> and yet their profits are brought today to the feet of salvation to do its blessed work. <laughs> Dear General, how blessed, how glorious it all is! Let us seize this unspeakable moment. Let us march to the great meeting at once. Uh, excuse me just an instant. The march! We are marching! <laughs> Mr. Undershaft, have you ever seen a thousand people fall on their knees with one impulse and pray? Come with us to the meeting. How could I refuse? Barbara shall tell them that the army is saved and saved through you. But, General. Come, come, everyone! Oh. Uh, you shall carry the flag, General Baines, here. An honor! That's it, General. Wave the flag. And, and Mr. Undershaft is a gifted trombonist. He shall intone an Olympian diapason to the West Ham Salvation March. Oh. Your instrument, Mr. Undershaft. I... Uh, blow, Machiavelli, blow. The trumpet in Zion, Euripides. Uh, I, I will do my best. I could vamp a bass if I knew the tune. It's a wedding chorus from one of Donizetti's operas, but we have converted it. Dolly, you're breaking my heart. Oh, what's a broken heart more or less here? Dionysus Undershaft has descended. I am possessed. Come, Barbara. I must have my dear Major to carry the flag with me. Yes, yes, Major, darling. Or, or, or play the tambourine. And give it back to Jenny. Oh, very well. So be it. Here. I can't come. Not come? Barbara, do you think I'm wrong to take the money? No, no, no. God help you, my dear. You must. You are saving the army. Go, go, and may you have a great meeting. Oh, but aren't you coming? I am not. Barbara, what are you doing? Why are you taking your badge off? You, you can't be going to leave us, Major. Father, come here. There, you have my badge. It's not much for five thousand pounds, is it? Wait for me, cousins. Hurry, Father Undershaft. Barbara, if you won't come and pray with us, promise me you will pray for us. I can't pray now. Perhaps I shall never pray again. Barbara. Major. I can't bear any more. Quick, march. Off we go. Play up there, immenso jubilo. Well, I, I must go, Barbara, dear. You're overworked. You will be all right tomorrow. We'll never lose you. Now, Jenny, step out with the old flag. Blood and fire. Glory, hallelujah. My ducats and my daughter. Money and gunpowder. Drunkenness and murder. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> What price salvation now, Major Barbara? I didn't accept your money, Bill. Snobby Price took it. What? Oh, it's gone, see? He didn't think I saw, but I watched him take it when he was leaving. Oh. Tell us, Major, what o'clock this morning was it when him as they call Snobby Price was saved? About half past twelve, Bill. And he pinched your pound just now. Well, you can't afford to lose it. I'll send it to you. I ain't to be bored. You wanted my soul, did you? Well, you ain't got it. I nearly got it, Bill. But we've sold it back to you for £10,000. And dear at the money. It was worth more than money. It's no good. You can't get round me now. I don't believe in it. And I've seen today that I was right. So long, Major Earl's granddaughter. What price salvation now? <laughs> Snobby price. <laughs> <laughs>
anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. <laughs> what price salvation now? It's on at the New London. Shall we get tickets? Barbara, are you keen to see the Scarlet Pimpernel? Mother, I really don't feel like going to... Good afternoon. Oh, Lady Bread. <laughs> Sarah. Barbara. I say. Barbara, you've left off your uniform. Charles. I'm awfully sorry, Barbara. Still, I have never shut my eyes to the fact that there is a certain amount of tosh about the Salvation Army. <laughs> now, the claims of the Church of England... That's enough, Charles. Speak of something suited to your mental capacity. Surely the Church of England is suited to all our capacities. Thank you for your sympathy, Charlie. Now, go and spoon with Sarah. <laughs> How is my illness today? I wish you wouldn't tell Charlie to do things, Barbara. He always comes straight and does them. Charlie? We're going to the cannon works at Paravel St Andrews this afternoon. What? Your governor's shop? Yes. Papa will be here soon. Oh, I say. I expected you this morning, Dolly. Didn't you guess that? Well, I'm sorry. I've only just uh, breakfasted. We've just finished lunch. Oh, you're wearing a dress, Barbara. I've never seen you in it. Have you had one of your bad nights? Well, actually, I had rather a good night. In fact, one of the most remarkable nights I have ever passed. The meeting? After the meeting. What were you doing? Drinking. Dolly! Dolphus! Are you joking, Dolly? Well, uh, no. No, I've been uh, making a night of it with the nominal head of this household, that's all. Andrew made you drunk? He only provided the wine. I think it was Dionysus who made me drunk. I told you, I was possessed. You're not sober yet. Go home to bed at once. I have never before ventured to reproach you, Lady Britt, but how could you marry the Prince of Darkness? It was much more excusable to marry him than to get drunk with him. He used to drink. Oh, he doesn't now. He only sat there and completed the wreck of my moral basis, the rout of my convictions, the purchase of my soul. He cares for you, Barbara, and that is what makes him so dangerous to me. That has nothing to do with it, Dolly. There are larger loves and diviner dreams than the fireside ones. You know that, don't you? Yeah, uh, that is our understanding. I know it. I hold to it. Unless he can win me on that holier ground, he may amuse me for a while, but he can get no deeper hold, as strong as he is. Keep to that, and the end will be right. Now, tell me what happened at the meeting. It was amazing. Mrs Baines almost died of emotion. Jenny Hill went stark mad with hysteria. <laughs> but the Prince of Darkness played his trombone like a madman. <laughs> Charles, its, its brazen roarings were like the laughter of the damned. 117 conversions took place then and there. They prayed with the most touching sincerity and gratitude for Bodger and for the anonymous donor of the £5,000. Your father would not let his name be given. Yeah, that was rather fine of the old man. Most chaps would have wanted the advertisement. He said all the charitable institutions would be down on him like kites on a battlefield <laughs> if he gave his name. That's Andrew all over. He never does a proper thing without giving an improper reason for it. He convinced me that I have all my life been doing improper things for proper reasons. Adolphus, now that Barbara has left the Salvation Army. You had better leave it, too. I will not have you playing that drum in the streets. No, your orders are already obeyed, Lady Britt. Dolly, were you ever really in earnest about it? Would you have joined if you had never seen me? Well, um, well, possibly, as a collector of religion. Not as a drummer, though, you know. <laughs> you are a very clear-headed, brainy chap, Dolly, and it must have been apparent to you that there is a certain amount of tosh about the Charles, if you must drivel, drivel like a grown-up man and not like a schoolboy. Well, drivel is drivel, whatever a man's age. <clears throat> Uh, begging your pardon, Lady Brittemart. Morrison, what is it? If you please, my lady, Mr Undershaft has arrived. Please tell him to join us. Very well, my lady. Barbara, Sarah, go and get ready.
Charles, go and tell Stephen to come here. You'll find him in the study. Will do, Lady Brett. Adolphus, tell them to send round the carriage. Oh, right away. Oh, what nonsense is this? <clears throat> Mr. Undershaft, my lady. Good afternoon, my dear. Alone. How fortunate. Oh, don't be sentimental, Andrew. Sarah must have £800 a year until Charles Lomax comes into his property. Mm. Barbara will need more and need it permanently because Adolphus hasn't any property. I will see to it. Anything else? I want to talk to you about Stephen. Don't, my dear. Stephen doesn't interest me. He does interest me. He is our son. Do you really think so? I see nothing of myself in him and less of you. Oh, Andrew... Stephen is an excellent son and a most steady, capable, high-minded young man. You are simply trying to find an excuse for disinheriting him. My dear Biddy, the undershaft tradition disinherits him. If you will do nothing for Stephen, you are not wanted here. <clears throat> Go to your foundling, whoever he is, and look after him. The fact is, Biddy... Oh, don't call me Biddy. I don't call you Andy. I will not call my wife Brittomart. It's not good sense. Seriously, my love, the undershaft tradition has landed me in a difficulty. I'm getting on in years, and my partner Lazarus has at last made a stand and insisted that the succession must be settled. I would say if you want to keep the foundry in the family, you had better find an eligible foundling and marry him to Barbara. Ah, uh, Barbara, your pet. You would sacrifice Stephen to Barbara. Cheerfully. And you, my dear, would boil Barbara to make soup for Stephen. Oh. Andrew, this is not a question of our likings and dislikings. It is a question of duty. It is your duty to make Stephen Mother. your... Good afternoon, Stephen. Good afternoon. He knows all about the tradition, I suppose? He does. It is what I told you the other day, Stephen. Quite. I understand you want to come into the cannon business. I go into trade. Certainly not. Oh, in that case... Cannons are not trade, Stephen. They are enterprise. I have no intention of becoming a man of business in any sense. I intend to devote myself to politics. My dear uh, boy, this is an immense relief to me. And I trust it may prove an equally good thing for the country. I cannot allow you to throw away an enormous property like this. Mother, there must be an end of treating me as a child, if you please. Stephen! Uh, until last night, I did not take your attitude seriously because I did not think you meant it seriously. But I find now that you have left me in the dark as to matters which you should have explained to me years ago. <sighs> I am extremely hurt and offended. Any further discussion of my intentions had better take place with my father as between one man and another. I see. I'm sorry, Mother, that you have forced me. Yes, 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 that's all right, Stephen. She won't interfere with you any more. Your independence is achieved. You have won your latchkey. It is settled that you do not ask for the succession to the cannon business. I hope it is settled that I repudiate the cannon business. Don't be so devilishly sulky. It's boyish. Freedom should be generous. Besides, I owe you a fair start in life in exchange for disinheriting you. You can't become Prime Minister all at once. Is there anything you know or care for? I know the difference between right and wrong. You don't say so. And I pretend to nothing more than any honourable English gentleman claims as his birthright. What do you think he had better do, Andrew? Oh, just what he wants to do. He knows nothing and he thinks he knows everything. That points clearly to a political career. I I'm sorry, sir, that you forced me to forget the respect due to you as my father. I'm an Englishman and I will not hear the government of my country insult it. I am the government of your country. I and Lazarus. Do you suppose that you and half a dozen amateurs like you, sitting in a row in that foolish gabble shop, can govern under Shaft and Lazarus? No, my friend, you will do what pays us. You will make war when it suits us and keep peace when it doesn't. And in return, you shall have the support and applause of my newspapers and the delight of imagining that you are a great statesman. <laughs> Government of your country. Really, my dear father, it is impossible to be angry with you. It is natural for you to think that money governs England, but you must allow me to think that I know better. And what does govern England, pray? Character. 
father. Character? Whose character? Yours or mine? Neither yours nor mine, father. But the best elements in the English national character. Stephen, I've found your profession for you. You're a born journalist. Uh, the carriage is here, Mama. Thank you. Good afternoon, Papa. Good day, my dear Sarah. And good afternoon, Mr. Lomax. How do you do? Quite well after last night, Euripides, eh? As well as can be expected. That's right. So, Barbara, you are coming to see my death and devastation factory? You came yesterday to see my salvation factory. I promised you a return visit. Uh, I've been through the Woolwich Arsenal, and it gives you a ripping feeling of security, you know, to think of the lot of beggars we could kill if it came to fighting. <laughs> Still, uh, Mr. Undershaft, it must be rather an awful reflection for you, from the religious point of view, as it were. You're getting on, you know, and all that. You don't mind Cholly's imbecility, Papa, do you? Oh, I say. Mr. Lomax looks at the matter in a very proper spirit, my dear. Just so. Uh, that's all I meant, I assure you. Are you coming, Stephen? Oh, well, I am rather busy. Uh, well, yes, I'll come. That is, if there's room for me. I could take two with me in the little motor I'm experimenting with for field use. You won't mind its being rather unfashionable? It's not painted yet, but it's bulletproof. Oh, I say. The carriage for me. Thank you. Barbara doesn't mind what she's seen in. <laughs> I shall enjoy to go in the car. You coming, Dolly? We too coming to this works department of hell. That's what I ask myself. I have always thought of it as a sort of pit where lost creatures with blackened faces stirred up smoky fires and were driven and tormented by my father. Is it like that, Dad? My dear, it is a spotlessly clean and beautiful hillside town. With a Methodist chapel? Oh, do say there's a Methodist chapel. There are two, a oh. primitive one and a sophisticated one. There's even an ethical society, but it is not much patronized as my men are all strongly religious. In the high explosives sheds, they object to the presence of agnostics as unsafe. And yet they don't object to you. Do they obey all your orders? I never give them any orders. When I speak to one of them, it is, well, Jones, is the baby doing well? And has Mrs. Jones made a good recovery? Nicely, thank you, sir. And that's all. But Jones has to be kept in order. How do you maintain discipline among your men? I don't. They do. I never meddle with them. I never bully them. I don't even bully Lazarus. I say that certain things are to be done, but I don't order anybody to do them. The result is a colossal profit which comes to me. You really are, uh, uh, well, uh, what I was saying yesterday. What was he saying yesterday? Never mind, my dear. He thinks I have made you unhappy. Have I? Do you think I can be happy in this vulgar, silly dress? I, who have worn the uniform. Do you understand what you have done to me? Yesterday, I had a man's soul in my hand. I set him in the way of life with his face to salvation. But when we took your money, he turned back to drunkenness and derision. I will never forgive you that. If I had a child and you destroyed its body with your explosives, if, if you murdered Dolly with your horrible guns, I could forgive you if my forgiveness would open the gates of heaven to you. But to take a human soul from me and turn it into the soul of a wolf, that is worse than any murder. St. Andrews, at the sign of the sword. Everything wonderful. Real. Neat little white red-roofed houses, domes, campaniles, slender chimney shafts, trees, birdsong, a babbling brook. Uh, and, and look, below, fat, happy trout. There you are! Ah, Stephen. What a place. Why did you two leave us? We wanted to see everything we were not intended to see. And Barbara wanted to make the men talk. Have you found anything discreditable? Not so far. They call him Dandy Andy. 
and are proud of his being a cunning old rascal. But it's all a horribly, frightfully, immorally, unanswerably perfect. Horribly, frightfully, immorally, unanswerably perfect. Well, there's Sarah. Heavens, what a town, isn't it? Did you see the nursing home? The libraries and the schools. The ballroom and the banqueting chamber in the town hall. Barbara, I saw... I plan to go and look at the little... Well, have you seen everything? I'm sorry I was called away. Telegram from Manchuria. Good news, I hope. Very. Another Japanese victory? Oh, uh, I don't know. Which side wins does not concern us here. No, the good news is that the aerial battleship is a tremendous success. At the first trial, it has wiped out a fort with 300 soldiers in it. Dummy soldiers? The real thing. Uh -oh. Father... Well, Stephen, what do you think of the place? Oh, magnificent. A perfect triumph of organisation. I only have one misgiving about it all. Out with it? Well, oh, I cannot help thinking that all this provision for every want of your workmen may sap their independence and weaken their sense of responsibility. And greatly as we enjoyed our tea at that splendid restaurant, how they gave us all that luxury cake and jam and cream for threepence I really cannot imagine. Still, you must remember that restaurants break up home life. Look at the continent, for instance. Are you sure that so much pampering is really good for the men's characters? A sufficient dose of anxiety is always provided by the fact that we may be blown to smithereens at any moment. Ah, ah, where are you? Fold! <laughs> My good fellow, you needn't get into a state of nerves. Nothing's going to happen to you. A little bit of British pluck is what you want, old chap. Bilton, what's happened? This gentleman walked into the high explosive shed and lit a cigarette, sir. That's all. Ah, oh, oh, uh, quite so. Mr Lomax, would you mind giving me the rest of the matches? Oh, certainly. You know, these high explosives don't go off like gunpowder, except when they're in a gun. <laughs> when they're spread loose, you can put a match to them without the least risk. They just burn quietly like a bit of paper. <laughs> Did you know that, Undershaft? Have you ever tried? Not on a large scale, Mr Lomax. Uh, Bilton will give you a sample of gun cotton when you're leaving. If you ask him, you can experiment with it at home. What? Bilton will do nothing of the sort, Papa. I suppose it's your business to blow up the Russians and Japs, but you might really stop short of blowing up poor Charlie. I... Oh, best get back to work. Uh, shall we go to the office? Alas, I can't alter the weather. Oh, you do surprise me, Father Undershaft. Good idea. Fine. Thank you. Mother, what glorious flowers. Let me smell them. Andrew. You shouldn't have let me see this place. Why, my dear? Never mind why. You shouldn't have, that's all. To think of all this being yours, the town, the factory, and that you've kept it to yourself all these years. It does not belong to me. I belong to it. It is the undershaft inheritance. Oh, it is not. Your ridiculous cannons and that noisy banging foundry may be the undershaft inheritance, but all that plate and linen, all that furniture and those houses and orchards and gardens belong to us. They belong to me. They are not a man's business. I won't give them up. You must be out of your senses to throw them all away. And if you persist in such folly, I will call in a doctor. Where did you get the flowers, my dear? Your men presented them to me in your William Morris Labour Church. Oh, it needed only that, a labour church. Yes, with Morris's words in mosaic letters, ten feet high around the dome. Mm. No man is good enough to be another man's master. Oh. <laughs> the cynicism of it. It shocked the men at first, I'm afraid, but now they take no more notice of it than of the Ten Commandments in church. <laughs> Andrew, are you trying to put me off the subject of the inheritance by profane jokes? Well, you shan't. I don't ask it any longer for Stephen. He has inherited far too much of your perversity to be fit for it. But Barbara has rights as well as Stephen. Why should not Adolphus succeed to the inheritance? Adolphus is exactly the sort of new blood that is wanted in English business. But he's not a foundling and there's an end of it. Not quite. <laughs> I, I think... Uh, mind, I'm not committing myself in any way as to my future course, but I think the foundling difficulty can be got over. What do you mean? I have something to say which is in the nature of a confession. I think we had better go into my office. Come on through, everyone. 
Sit here, my dear. No, I will not. I will stand for this. As you wish. <clears throat> Cousins, you mentioned... Yes, a confession. Until I met Barbara, I thought myself in the main an honourable, truthful man, because I wanted the approval of my conscience more than I wanted anything else. But the moment I saw Barbara, I wanted her far more than the approval of my conscience. Adolphus! It's true. You accused me yourself, Lady Brit, of joining the army to worship Barbara, and so I did. She bought my soul like a flower at a street corner. But she bought it for herself. Dolly! What? Not for Dionysus or another? But Dionysus and all the others are in herself. I adored what was divine in her, and was therefore a true worshipper. But I was romantic about her too. I thought she was a woman of the people, and that a marriage with a professor of Greek would be far beyond the wildest social ambitions of her rank. <laughs> <laughs> Say, oh man. Charlie, don't interrupt. When I learnt the horrible truth. What do you mean by the horrible truth, pray? That she was enormously rich, that her grandfather was an earl, and that her father was the Prince of Darkness. Really? And that I was only an adventurer trying to catch a rich wife. Then I stooped to deceive about my birth. Your birth? Now, Adolphus, don't dare to make up a wicked story for the sake of these wretched canons. Remember, I have seen photographs of your parents. And the Agent General for Southwestern Australia knows them personally and has assured me that they are most respectable married people. So they are, in Australia. But here, they are outcasts. Their marriage is legal in Australia, but not in England. My mother is my father's deceased wife's sister. And in this island, I am consequently a foundling. Oh. Oh. Biddy. This may be a way out of the difficulty. Stuff! A man can't make canons any the better for being his own cousin instead of his proper self. You are an educated man. That is against the tradition. Well, once in 10,000 times it happens that the schoolboy is a born master of what they try to teach him. Greek has not destroyed my mind, it has nourished it. Well, I cannot afford to be too particular. You have cornered the foundling market. You are eligible, Euripides. You are eligible. Take care. There is an abyss of moral horror between me and your accursed aerial battleships. Never mind the abyss for the present. Let us settle the practical details and leave your final decision open. You know that you will have to change your name. Do you object to that? Would any man named Adolphus, any man called Dolly, <laughs> object to being called something else? Good. Now, as to money, I propose to treat you handsomely from the beginning. You shall start at a thousand a year. Uh, no, by heavens, Machiavelli, you shall not cheat me. You cannot do without me, and I can do without you. I must have 2,500 a year for two years. <laughs> and at the end of that time, if I'm a failure, I go. But if I'm a success and stay on, you must give me the other 5,000. What other 5,000? To make the two years up to 5,000 a year. The 2,500 is only half pay, in case I should turn out a failure. The, the third year, I must have 10% on the profits. A born businessman. 10%? Why, man, do you know what my profits are? Enormous, I hope. Dolly! But, Mr. Cousins, this is a serious matter of business. You are not bringing any capital into the concern. No capital? Is my mastery of Greek no capital? <laughs> Mr. Undershaft, you have my terms. Take them or leave them. I note your terms, and I offer you half. You call yourself a gentleman, and you offer me half. I do not call myself a gentleman, but I offer you half. <laughs> this to your future partner, your successor, your son-in-law. You are selling your own soul, Dolly, not mine. Leave me out of the bargain, please. I will go a step further for Barbara's sake. I will give you three-fifths, but that is my last word. Done. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> is the bargain closed, Dolly? Does your soul belong to him now? The price is settled, that is all. The real tug of war is still to come. What about the moral question? Oh, there is no moral question in the matter at all, Adolphus. You must simply sell cannons and weapons to people whose cause is right and just and refuse them to foreigners and criminals. No, none of that. You must keep the true faith of an armourer or you don't come in here. What on earth is the true faith of an armourer? To give arms to all men who offer an honest price for them without respect of persons or principles. My good Machiavelli, as to your armourer's faith, if I take my neck out of the noose of my own, 
morality, I am not going to put it into the noose of yours. I shall sell cannons to whom I please, and refuse them to whom I please. From the moment when you become Andrew Undershaft, you will never do as you please again. Do not come here lusting for power, young man. If power were my aim, I should not come here for it. You have no power. None of my own, certainly. You do not drive this place, it drives you. And what drives the place? A will of which I am a part. Father, do you know what you are saying? Are, are you laying a snare for my soul? Don't listen to his metaphysics, Barbara. The place is driven by the most rascally part of society. The money hunters, the pleasure hunters, the military promotion hunters, and he is their slave. You tire me, Euripides, with your morality mongering. Ask Barbara. She understands. Tell him, my love, what power really means. Before I joined the Salvation Army, I was in my own power, and the consequence was that I never knew what to do with myself. When I joined it, I had not time enough for all the things I had to do. Just so. And why was that, do you suppose? Yesterday, I should have said, because I was in the power of God. But you came, and at the stroke of your pen in a checkbook, showed me that... I was in the power of Bodger and Undershaft. Come, come, my daughter. What do we do here when we spend years of work and thought and thousands of pounds of solid cash on a new gun or an aerial battleship that turns out just a hair's breadth wrong after all? Scrap it. If your old religion broke down yesterday, get a newer and a better one for tomorrow. Oh, how gladly I would take a better one to my soul, but you offer me a worse one. <laughs> Justify yourself. Show me some light through the darkness of this dreadful place with its beautifully clean workshops and respectable workmen and model homes. Cleanliness and respectability do not need justification, Barbara. They justify themselves. I see no darkness here, no dreadfulness. In your salvation shelter, I saw poverty, misery, cold and hunger. And their souls? I saved their souls just as I saved yours. You saved my soul? What do you mean? I fed you and clothed you and housed you. I took care that you should have money enough to live handsomely. I enabled Barbara to become Major Barbara. And I saved her from the crime of poverty. Do you call poverty a crime? The worst of crimes. There are millions of poor people. They poison us morally and physically. They kill the happiness of society. Only fools fear crime. We all fear poverty. Ha! You talk of your half-saved ruffian in West Ham. You accuse me of dragging his soul back to perdition. Well, bring him to me here, and I will drag his soul back again to salvation for you. Not by words and dreams, but by 38 shillings a week, a sound house in a handsome street and a permanent job. And will he be the better for that? You know he will. Don't be a hypocrite, Barbara. It is cheap work converting starving men with a Bible in one hand and a slice of bread in the other. Try your hand on my men. Their souls are hungry because their bodies are full. And leave the East End to starve? <sighs> I was an East Ender. I moralized and starved until one day I swore that I would be a full-fed free man at all costs, that nothing should stop me except a bullet, neither reason nor morals nor the lives of other men. I said, thou shalt starve ere I starve, and with that word I became free and great. That is the history of most self-made millionaires, and when it is the history of every Englishman, we shall have an England worth living in. Andrew, your ideas are nonsense. You got oil because you were selfish and unscrupulous. Not at all. I had the strongest scruples about poverty and starvation, but poverty and slavery have stood up for centuries to sermons and leading articles. They will not stand up to my machine guns. Don't preach at them, don't reason with them. Kill them, Father. Oh, Killing? Is that your remedy for everything? It is the final test of conviction. What about it, cousins? Come and make explosives with me. Whatever can blow men up can blow society up. The history of the world is the history of those who had courage enough to embrace this truth. Have you the courage to embrace it, Barbara? Barbara, I positively forbid you to listen to your father's abominable wickedness. 
Children, come home instantly. Andrew, I am exceedingly sorry I allowed you to call on us. You are wickeder than ever. Mm. Come at once. It is no use running away from wicked people, Mama. It does not save them. I can see that you are going to disobey me. Sarah, are you coming home or are you not? I dare say it's very wicked of Papa to make cannons, but I don't think I shall cut him on that account. You must look at facts. Not that I would say a word in favour of anything wrong, but then, you see, you know, all sorts of chaps are always doing all sorts of things, and you have to fit them in somehow, don't you know? I, uh, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. You are lucidity itself, Charles. Because Andrew is successful and has plenty of money to give to Sarah, you will flatter him and encourage him in his wickedness. Well... Where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered, don't you know? Precisely. By the way, may I call you Charles? Oh, uh, Charlie is the usual ticket. Euripides, make up your mind. Understand this, you old demon. You have me in a horrible dilemma. I want Barbara. I also want to avoid being a rascal. You lust for personal righteousness, for self-approval, for what you call a good conscience, for what Barbara calls salvation, for what I call patronising people who are not so lucky as yourself. I do not. All the poet in me recoils from being a good man, but there are things in me that I must reckon with. Love, for instance. Love. Father, do you love nobody? I love my best friend. And who is that, pray? My bravest enemy. That is the man who keeps me up to the mark. You know... The creature is really a sort of poet in his way. <laughs> Suppose he is a great man, after all. Come, you will suit me. Remember the words of Plato. Uh, Plato? You dare quote Plato to me? Plato says, my friend, that society cannot be saved until either the professors of Greek take to making gunpowder or else the makers of gunpowder become professors of Greek. Oh, <laughs> tempter. Cunning tempter. But perhaps... Barbara will not marry me if I make the wrong choice. Perhaps not. Suppose you stop talking and make up your mind, my young friend? But you are driving me against my nature. I hate war. Hatred is the coward's revenge for being intimidated. Dare you make war on war? May we expect you here at six tomorrow morning? Oh, I, I will see the whole establishment blown up with its own dynamite before I will get up at five. My hours are healthy, rational hours. Eleven to five. Come when you please. Before a week, you will come at six and stay until I turn you out for the sake of your health. My dear, let us leave these two young people to themselves for a moment. Come, Stephen. Come, Charles. Bring Sarah. A dolly, old fellow. Think before you decide. It's a huge undertaking, and an enormous responsibility. All this mass of business will be Greek to you. Oh, I think it'll be much less difficult than Greek. Barbara, I'm going to accept this offer. I thought you would. You understand, don't you, that I had to decide without consulting you. If I'd thrown the burden of the choice on you, you would sooner or later have despised me for it. Yes. I did not want you to sell your soul for me any more than for this inheritance. It, it's not the sale of my soul that troubles me. I, I've sold it too often to care about that. But what I am now selling it for is neither money nor position nor comfort, but for reality and for power, not for myself alone. I want to make power for the world. I want to make power for the world too, but it must be spiritual power. Well, I think all power is spiritual. These cannons will not go off by themselves. The power that is made here can be wielded by all men. Power to burn women's houses down and kill their sons and tear their husbands to pieces. You, you cannot have power for good without having power for evil too. Even mother's milk nourishes murderers as well as heroes. This power, which only tears men's bodies to pieces, has never been so horribly abused as the intellectual power, the imaginative power, the poetic, religious power that can enslave men's souls. As a teacher of Greek, I gave the intellectual man weapons against the common man. I now want to give the common man weapons against the intellectual man. I love the common people. I want a democratic power strong enough to force the intellectual oligarchy to use its genius for the general good or else perish. Is there no higher power than a weapon? Yes, but that power can destroy the higher powers, just as a tiger can destroy a man. Therefore, man must master that power first. Your father's challenge has beaten me. Uh, dare I make war on war? I dare. 
I must. I will. And now, is it all over between us? Silly baby dolly, how could it be? Then, then you... Oh, for my drum! Don't take care, Dolly, take care. If only I could get away from you and from father and from it all. And leave me? Yes, you and all the other naughty, mischievous children of men. But I can't. I was happy in the Salvation Army for a moment. I escaped from the world into a paradise of enthusiasm and prayer and soul-saving. But the moment our money ran short, it all came back to Bodger. It was he who saved our people. He and the Prince of Darkness, my papa, turning our backs on Bodger and Undershaft is turning our backs on life. But I, I thought you were determined to turn your back on the wicked side of life. There is no wicked side. Life is all one. Do you know what would have happened if you had refused Papa's offer? I, I wonder. I should have given you up and married the man who accepted it. After all, my dear old mother has more sense than any of you. I felt like her when I saw this place, felt that I must have it, that never, never, never could I let it go. Only she thought it was the houses and the kitchen ranges and the linen and the china, when really it was all the human souls to be saved. That is where salvation is really wanted. And my father shall never throw it in my teeth again that my converts were bribed with bread. I have got rid of the bribe of bread. I have got rid of the bribe of heaven. Let God's work be done for its own sake, the work he had to create us to do, because it cannot be done except by living men and women. When I die, let him be in my debt, not I in his, and let me forgive him, as becomes a woman of my rank. Then the way of life lies through the factory of death? Yes, through the raising of hell to heaven and of a man to God, through the unveiling of an eternal light in the valley of the shadow. Oh, did you think my courage would never come back? Did you believe that I was a deserter, that I, who have stood in the streets and taken my people to my heart and talked of the holiest and greatest things with them, could ever turn back and chatter foolishly to fashionable people about nothing in a drawing room? <laughs> never, 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 never. Major Barbara will die with the colours. Oh, and I have my dear little dolly boy still, and he has found me my place and my work. Oh, glory, hallelujah! <laughs> Oh, my dearest, <laughs> consider my delicate health. I cannot stand as much happiness as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Papa, Mama, everyone, come in, please. Father? Cousins, well, what does she say? What do you want, Barbara? I want a house in the village to live in with Dolly. In Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw, Barbara was played by Eleanor Tomlinson and Adolphus Cousins by Jack Farthing. Undershaft was played by Matthew Marsh, Lady Britomart by Rebecca Front, and Stephen by Joel McCormack. Charles Lomax was played by Kieran Hodgson, Sarah by Scarlett Brooks, and Morrison by Brian Prothero. Jenny Hill was played by Nicola Ferguson, Mrs. Baines by Susan Jameson, and Bill Walker by Ewan Bailey. Snobby Price was played by Sargon Yelda, Rummy Mitchins by A.D. Allen, and Peter Shirley by Sean Baker. The concertina was played by Colin Guthrie, and the cornet by Peter Ringrose. The director was Tracy Neal.